Now, we will get on to Manet and Degas. Um, this, is, this is a big subject. Um, the show is going to be in, you know, taking place next fall. Um, and, you know, September 25th of uh, 2023. So there's a good deal of uh, lag between now and when that's going to take place. But still, um, there's plenty of their work in the Metropolitan Museum already. Um, the show is put together between the Metropolitan and the Museum d'Orsay um, in France. And that um, the, the collections put together are really uh, a dialogue between these two artists in 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 many ways. That's that's what they're shooting for. Um, the exhibition explores this this interaction between them. They were friends, rivals, and at times antagonists. Um, in many ways, they helped redefine. Um, modern painting in France and really kind of were pivotal um, characters in, in um, the shift from um, what was considered realism at that time into impressionism and modernist approaches to thinking about making art. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so, um, both were academically trained, um, their careers ran parallel courses in many ways, they, they, their objectives, um, overlapped and diverged. Um, so this shows bringing together over 150 paintings work and works on paper from the Met and, uh, and the Museum d'Orsay. Uh, the, the show really explores the um, interaction of, of these two innovative artists in the context of their family relations, their friendships, and their intellectual circle. I gotta turn this thing off. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, the the parallels start early because basically uh, uh, Degas' father wanted, they, they both came from fairly wealthy families. They came from society and um, there was a certain amount of wealth behind it. Um, uh, Degas' father wanted him to study law and um, Although Degas did register for for uh, classes in 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 um, in law, um, he really was was um, much more interested in making art, and so that really kind of took over. Manet's father was a judge, so the expectation was there that he would study law also. Um, Though Manet's uncle encouraged him to pursue his artistic talent. And um, both artists began working with what was considered to be a, a, a kind of academic realism. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, gonna hop to the next slide here. And this is, this is going toward the end of Manet's career. Manet died young. He died at, uh, at 51 years old. Um, and this is, this is like two years before he died. Um, you can see this, you know, the beautiful color, the beautiful brushwork. He, he was, he was a, a really terrific painter. Um, it looks like Impressionism. But in fact, this was staged inside his studio. Um, Manet was 
known to work and rework his paintings and tried to keep the brushwork fresh, but but he was he was not a one shot deal painter. For the most part, he would work and rework. He would work up a painting, and if he wasn't satisfied with what was going on by the end of the day, he would scrape it all down and start over again the next day. And let's see. Oop, wait a minute. Sorry, <laughs> skipping too far forward. This is a mature Degas. Um, this was from around the same time. This was 1879. The other was 1871. Um, and the dance, the dance lesson is typical of the kind of work that that Degas got into. This cropping and the the use of of, of pastel. Um, he would he would assemble drawings. He would work on studies for for the drawings and um, use tracing paper to to transfer the drawings or even use tracing paper as the ground that he would draw on. So he would do his pastels directly on trace. And that would that would be, you know, he would try variations on the poses and try different color combinations and things like that in the same composition. So you will see that in, in his work, and I have some of that in, in this presentation. Um, so actually, if you look really closely at this, you can see that there, there was paper, a strip of paper that was added onto the top and a strip of paper that was added onto the side uh, of, of this pastel. Okay. All right. So Manet was uh, he he studied academically and and you know actually worked in in that setting for six years. Um, he traveled to to Spain and fell madly in love with the Spanish and the Spanish approach to painting. Um, there there was something about the freshness of the paint and how they how they applied it that that he emulated and Velasquez was his was his basically his uh mentor his paint mentor um and you can see the similarities between these uh poses that Velasquez is taking in in Las Niñas um now remember Los Niños because basically we are going to go to um, this, which was which was one of um, Manet's pieces that he he um, entered into the salon and got accepted, although they um, criticized it for the broad areas of kind of un. Um, modulated um, uh, areas of paint um, and the kind of tattered shoes that this guy's wearing and the cigarette on the floor you know it's it's a it's a very casual painting and um, most of the academy was was really about polish and and mythological characters and religious um, um, scenes or battle scenes. Um, and they were all very, um, um, what was the word that was used? Lick, um, very smooth, very polished. This is much rougher. Okay. And now we're gonna go on to Degas. And the Bellelli family, was actually they were relatives. This was his aunt, and um, uh, this piece was also accepted into the academy and criticized for a number of different things that were going on there. Um, I think that that one of the things that um, that happens in this painting is. Um, It's it. There's a coldness to it. 
and the uh, and the father is facing away from us not towards us so the classical way that you do a family portrait would be full on straight on portraits and this is very different from that i also mentioned los ninos um in this painting he he actually was referring to velasquez in that he um from that painting if you recall it, well, I can go back actually, let's see, here we go. Um, you can see the deep space that's behind it and the, the use of the architectural elements. There's a window over here, there's a door out the back, there's all kinds of things going on in it. When we come to this, he's using the mirror on, on the right as a device to create depth. And, and sense of space. And on the left, you can see there's a doorway or a window off on that side. The, the interesting part about this is the psychological aspect of it, the coolness that's going on within this family. And that was really something that Degas was picking up on. There, there was tension in the family and, and he put that into the painting. see. All right, we're now going to take a deep dive into the young revolutionary Manet. Um, it's not like there were no classical nudes included in the in the um, Academy show, but this piece was rejected. And um, They were classical nudes. They were classical mythological characters. They were religious images. This is not that. This woman is an, an everyday woman in this situation. The other, the other aspect of this is there's very finished areas in the painting and other areas which are left very brushy, like up in those trees. It's very loose. It doesn't seem like anything to us now, but this, this painting was really a stab at the heart of polite society. Um, and there was just... Um, he, he actually um, was rejected along with 1,500 other artists, and they created their own show called, um, and I'm going to go here, actually. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Excuse me. There we go. The salon had had certain ways of operating and they would reject things that that didn't fit in with their criteria they had a jury of of artists and and politicians they would decide what was going in so there was a show called uh la, la refuse uh basically the the folks that didn't get in created their own show and a lot of people went to it there was outrage around Manet's painting, and it was criticized roundly by by the critics, and people people were just shocked by it. Um, it doesn't seem like that much to me now, or to us now, given given what goes on. But at the time, to have a real woman looking out at you, and she was like, <laughs> she wasn't. <laughs> not looking at it she was looking straight into the into the viewer you can see here some of the images on the lower right hand corner let's see if i can get the um get the zoom up so we can close in on this a little bit you can see what the images were now it's not that there were no nudes but they were classical nudes they were looking away they were madonna and child they were things that that were acceptable in the canon it was not um uh an uh, an everyday lady off the street um and and there's a uh there were 
um, cartoons made about this and all that. Daumier made this. Just look at what a degenerated and corrupt world we're living in. Uh, very funny. So, um, you know, this gives you some idea of the atmosphere that, that Manet was going into with these pieces. And he was stung by the criticism. He, he on the one hand, was trying to do something that was, that was innovative and new, but he also wanted the acceptance of the academy at the same time. And uh, <laughs> that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a rough combination to try and find. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Okay. Sorry, I'm having some trouble with my mouse right now. Okay, good. Um, so the the next piece and the next year, he he entered this piece, um, which is the Olympia. And and at first, when you look at it, it it you know it's it's pretty much a straightforward nude. Um, to to us today, you know, it's a little racy, but hey, um, we've 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 seen we've seen a lot worse in uh, uh, on ads on TV, um, but. Again, in that time, we're talking about somebody who was obviously a courtesan. She's looking straight out at us. And it's it was it was a shocking thing. They had to get guards to prevent people from poking this thing with a stick. Um, they, the people got that outraged at it. And here's here is a, a, a series of, of pieces now. Below you see Giorgione, um, Sleeping Venus. She's not looking at us. She's set in this bu bucolic landscape. On, on the right, um, his, his heir, Titian, Venus of Urbino. This one is kind of coyly looking at us, but again, she's a mythological character. She's Venus. She's not... Um, uh, your everyday woman. Goya painted the Maya, and she he painted a naked Maya, but the naked Maya was never put out there in public. He kept it in his studio. No one ever saw that one, where Manet put this out in the world. Um, and you can see the gaze on, on, on this model. Um, Victorine. Victorine was was the model for um, uh, the picnic on the grass also, uh, the luncheon on the grass. Um, and he she was actually one of his favorite models. He would use her in four or five major pieces, and we'll see a few more of her. Um, but in this in this painting, you see the Titian, which is which is the one kind of in the middle. Uh, on the on the right, there's a little dog sleeping on the on the on the couch. And what does uh, Olympia have? She's got a black cat which is arching its back, hissing at us. We're kind of invading her space, and and this cat is defending her. Um, you know, the the black maid is bringing um, a a a present. Uh, from one of her suitors, and basically she's kind of ignoring it, um, you know, indifferent. So, Dega. Um, now, you know, this portrait looks looks very, you know, it's very straightforward. It's 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 quite lovely. Um, not, you know, um, a um, a court painting by any means. She's she's his cousin. Um, lovely, well done realism. Um, on the on the right, we have this cropping. We have this um, um, photographic kind of um, 
um, focus and, you know, having the heads cropped off the, the ballerinas on stage is a very um, audacious approach. And you'll find this again and again in, in Degas' compositions where he will take a point of view, which is very, very unique. Okay. And um, we're we're back to uh, Manet and the big flattened shapes and um, the Spanish theme again. Um, the these are they they look like really you know very accomplished um realist paintings again he was he was very much influenced by by the spanish um there's there's nothing going on in those backgrounds it's really it's really stark many many of the academicians at the time would would put put these figures into very um, elaborate backgrounds and all of that. So this is more of that um, uh, something that he adopted and adapted to, to what he was after. Um, there's a starkness to these paintings. And again, um, this is uh, this is Degas and the and and the cropping the 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 way um, uh, this vase of flowers almost pushes the figure right off the edge of the canvas. Now, this is Madame Paul Paul. And I'm not I'm not going to do well with this name, um, Valpignon. I believe is how it's pronounced, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but Paul Valpignon was, a, was a, a friend from childhood. One of the things that I am gonna go a little bit into is Degas, Degas was a very shy guy and, and um, socially awkward, shall we say. And, and he, maintained friendships with a number of people and really depended on that for a kind of stability in a certain way. And this family was one of those families which he kind of adopted and uh, adopted him. Um, not that he didn't have a big family of his own, but... And this is, this is a painting of her daughter. Um, Uh, so, let's see. Beautifully handled painting. Um, I want to go back for a moment to this one, and and talk a little bit about what's going on with her. Um, you know, she's she's got her hand in front of her mouth, and it's kind of like she's she's got something on her mind is she about to speak is she about to weep what's going on there you know that 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 is an interesting kind of ambiguous psychological aspect of of this piece um again beautifully painted um Okay, and now we're gonna step into Manet and Degas and their relationship to each other. Um, basically, they they were they were close to one another because they were both battling the the 
the academy in a certain way. They were um, uh, both wanted approval and and did not want to be restricted by the stodginess of that atmosphere. And um, they were they were friends. They they spent time together. They would they would you know. Um, Basically, one of the aspects of this is, is Manet was a very charming, outgoing fellow. Um, he, was, he was really cultured. Um, he was a ladies' man. Um, he married, but actually what happened was, was his father had hired this woman, Suzanne, to come and she was she was a very accomplished pianist the father hired her to come and 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 teach the three children um uh piano and give piano lessons and um edward started up a affair with her and that that continued um she was a fine musician um but basically um not in an acceptable class for the father um so they kept their their affair hidden until until the father's death they actually had a child out of wedlock um but they did marry as soon as the father passed this being said, you know, Manet and Degas both shared this sense of trying to bring um, a more uh, direct relationship to the world around them into their paintings. They didn't want to paint mythological figures. They didn't want to paint... Um, these um, outside outside st stories of of um, of war and 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 um, uh, glories of the past. So they shared a lot in common, and basically, um, somebody like Baudelaire and and Zola. Uh, really um, highly praised both of their works and and felt that they were doing with painting what those two were trying to do with literature and poetry. Um, neither one of them, which is really interesting, considered themselves to be impressionist painters which is which is was was hard for me to quite get because I always associated Manet with with the beginning of impressionism and blah 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 and Degas also right in there with the impressionists but they both held on to this notion of 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 realism as some some level of grit being part of their paintings now what we're seeing here is a painting that that Degas did on the on the left of of Manet and his wife and it was a full painting it turns out Manet mm, we're not quite clear about why um it may be that he didn't like the likeness that that Degas had had given to uh, Suzanne, but he slashed the painting. Um, on the right, you see one of Manet's paintings of of his wife Suzanne playing the piano. Um, this actually. Um, did you know uh put a put a rift between them as you would expect but it wasn't it wasn't um it just it really cooled their friendship for some time but it didn't end it 
because they were too close to each other in in what they were trying to fight for in the art world. Um, okay, now we're going to move on to Bertha Marceau. Bertha Marceau was a wonderful artist in and of herself, and um, uh, she was actually the grand niece of Fragonard, which who was a romantic painter, a uh, French very famous painter. Um, so it was it was in the blood. And she she um, was, for my money, a really, really terrific painter who died way too young. She was only 54 when she died. So she really didn't have a chance to fully realize what was possible in her work although if you if you get to see some of her work you'll you will you'll see there's something there that was quite remarkable um this painting on the on the left is uh Bertha Marceau modeling for Manet in in this in this odd little painting and you see on the right um Mahas on the balcony by Goya, and this was this was actually one of the sources for the composition for um, uh, Manet. Again, criticism from the critics. Hey, you know it it goes with the territory at this stage of the game. Okay, there's this gorgeous portrait of Bertha Marceau. Bertha Marceau was really um, close to Manet, and and um, she was a muse. She was a fellow artist. She could talk with him about about the issues that that he was dealing with, and that they were both dealing with, um, and you know. Morisot challenged him in certain ways. She was um, up on this impressionist business. She was um, using those techniques and the freshness of the brushwork and all of that. Um, so Manet, Manet was was really challenged by this, and and you know, just um, it it did feed into his work. And so it went both ways. The Impressionists looked up to Manet, admired his, his boldness and admired his wish to integrate um, everyday life in, into the work. Um, and that was really part of what they were all about in their revolution. Um, here is a whole page full and there are more of portraits that that Manet did of of Marceau, um, and you see in the upper right here a self portrait by Bertha Marceau. So you can see the technique, the approach, the freshness, the um, direct sketchy quality of that piece. Um, Manet supported the Impressionists. He felt that it was it was a really important movement, that there was something going on there that he that he admired and tried to integrate it in his own way. But he was never an Impressionist. Um, he was never fully abandoning the the working and reworking of of his of his canvases. He would never abandon black. Uh, and one of the things that Manet, uh, that Monet and Renoir did was banish black from their from their uh, their palettes. Um, uh, if if they were painting a shadow, it would be blue, or it would be purple, or it would be a combination of things to make to make a dark, but not a black. Um, Manet continued 
in that in that dark vein and use that as as a as a graphic tool and it's something that he brought from the spanish to his work okay and here we have um a painting on the right by Bertha Marceau, Woman and Child on Balcony, um, 1872. And, and on, on the left, you see Manet's Railway. And that was painted in 1872, 1873. So he would have seen what Bertha Marceau had done with, the, with the, the railing and with the child and the mother and child. This um, railway, again, is um, uh, Victorine. This, I think, was the last time that he used her. It's very, you know, it's wonderful with a little puppy sleeping in the lap. But, but again, there's this, there's this, that, this confrontation of us in a certain way. There's, you know, her look, gaze out at us. Um, and then there's this beautiful dress on this child, incredibly painted. Uh, I can't, I can't help but ooh and ah over that stuff. Uh, <laughs> Morso married um, uh, Edward's brother Eugene. Um, um, she remained close with 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 Manet. It's said that Degas had a bit of a crush on, on um, Morisot, but was too shy to pursue her. Um, well, that's conjecture. And, and um, the, the other side of it is how relevant it is to the paintings. <laughs> uh, here is um, a, a summer trip that that Manet took to see Monet and Renoir painting out on on the Seine um, and basically um, you see um, Manet's painting of Monet painting on his his boat his boat studio out on the out on the water Above you see um, uh, Monet's painting from around the same time. Um, and on the top, you see Manet's painting of Monet's family. And on the bottom, you see Renoir's version of it. And you can see the differences between them. I mean, the use of black in 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 um, uh, Manet's painting, as opposed to using green variations on green in in the in the Renoir. But you know, um, it, it, it's an interesting thing to see the the composite the similarities and differences in the composition. And this was painted back in the studio by, by Manet. Um, he, you know, went to these younger artists to study their brushwork and try and integrate that quality into, into his work. Um, so this is, this again is another studio invention. He would have done drawings out there on, you know, and, and brought those back, but that's that that's what this is all about uh, let's see Whoop. Oh, okay um so moybridge did this study of of horses you've probably seen them horses people in motion um animals of all kinds in motion and this was revolutionary the to, to see that to see that all four feet on a horse at full gallop were off the ground was 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 shocking um, to to some of them because the equestrian paintings never did that they always had one foot down well um, both Manet 
and and Degas would have seen this study that 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 Muybridge did, and and that really was provocative. I mean, Degas more than Manet was fascinated by photography. In fact, he took his own photographs and used many of them for for his paintings. So this really had a profound effect on artists at that time. Um, Okay, and again, we're back to Zola and Baudelaire, uh, the kind of gritty realism that that um, that was a touchstone for both Manet and Degas. Um, you know, the absinthe drinker. Um, you know, this the absinthe drinker by Manet was a very early. That was eighteen fifty nine, and um, was again uh, a painting that was rejected by the by the salon. Um, you don't do things like that. Sorry, buddy. Uh, <laughs> and then you know, there's this beautiful, exquisite little little piece by by uh, Manet, the plum brandy piece. Um, from, and that's fairly late, 1877, since he only lived until 1883. Um, a very tender piece in many ways. Um, you know, the absinthe drinker by Degas is much more wretched, um, rather, rather depressing uh visit to the to the cafe um okay and now we're going to move on to the dance and i would say that close to half of degas artwork was related to dance or theater or the cafe in some way or other um uh, these pieces again are this this business of 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 repetition. Uh, you can see that the same composition is repeated in the in the oil painting that is in the drawing. Um, he may well have taken um, the the drawing. This may be a this may be on um, on trace. So he may have traced this off of the off of the oil painting that he had done. Again, looking at the oil painting, you can see how chalky it looks. It's it's oil paint, but he used to do something called wicking. What he would do is take the oil paint and put it on paper, put it on newspaper or something like that, and he would wick off the oil so that the, the paint would become rusty, like pastel. And he would apply the the, the paint using that using that kind of a technique. Okay. These compositions are really, you know, innovative. Uh, there, there was no one doing something like this before Degas entered into this. Again, back to the photograph and, and that, that use of, of um, composition and cropping and all that. The other aspect of this is there's a sense of of the Japanese print having a profound effect on these guys. In, in the Japanese prints, there are big areas, big open areas that, that, are, that are unoccupied and then condensed areas that have a lot of figures or a, a lot of activity going on. Um, and Degas was definitely looking at those. In fact, he collected many of them. Degas was a collector, and and he had a, a really wonderful collection. He bought a lot of of Monet and and Renoir and Pizarro, um, all of the impressionists he had in his collection, and they 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 appreciated the support that he gave them. Uh, and here we have, you know one of his really mature, beautiful pieces. The color 
in this is is exquisite the the use of complementary colors the play of the dense um uh blues and and integrated with the oranges and playing back and forth between those things and using those using the charcoal to tone the pastel um within the figure again cropping interesting composition interesting point of view So he loved this dramatic lighting. He loved the the um, the the theater and that aspect of things. Now, if you look at this painting and you really squint your eyes at it, you can see that there's an all over field of color that kind of undulates through it, and the figures play off of those those subtle changes throughout the composition. And again, render it in vivid yellow, turquoise, and orange reflects the artist's experimentation with saturated hues and color contrasts in the mid 1880s. It's really incredible, um, you know how powerful this this was at that time. You know, this was before um, before the the. Um, innovations that took place in the 20th century. Someone had a question. Oh, okay, I'm going to keep going. To thank you, Larry. Okay. Um, the Miller shop is, is a, um, uh, this all over orange business that's happening in the in the lower part of the the painting um um with the complementary contrast of green and turquoise blue um the figures obscured by the table and the hats so we're kind of distanced from it um okay and here we have Mary Cassatt. Mary Cassatt was very close to Degas. They worked together. In fact, she was the muse to Degas that, that Morisot was to Manet. Um, they were very close. Um, uh, she learned a great deal from him. Um, uh, they actually were the organizers of the first Impressionist exhibit. Um, Mary Cassatt, Degas, and uh, another um, wealthy um, uh, Impressionist painter, Kaibot, were the original organizers of the Impressionist exhibits, and they were fundamentally involved um, throughout all those, all those exhibits. I'm going to keep moving. Um, this painting has so many textures in it that um, I, I can't even begin to talk about that. At the Milliners, um, uh, this again is Mary Cassatt. And, and um, there's, there's a... Um, extraordinary composition here you know it's it's it, it, there are pieces joined into it and things like that he used to do that he would add paper on onto a composition and things like that um Degas did show with the impressionists unlike Manet um so he didn't he didn't feel like he needed to uh, push it push it away. But these these shots inside the milliner shop are very intimate. They're, they're interactive pieces. There there's um, uh, a kind of we're there with them and at that moment. And then there's the the nudes. Um, I'm not going to go into all this now because we're we're pushing the time. Um, but 
the, look at the modeling on the back of the the one on the left, the woman combing uh, combing her own hair. Those those stripes, those strokes, the directionality of the strokes to define the planes of the back, the use of light and dark, and how and how that is integrated into the 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 interior of of the room, and those colors are muted in her body but they're there in the in the ground of the of the room okay um i'm going to i'm going to address this one on the right because it's it's just such a fabulous piece um um basically the still life on the table really comes up into our faces and we get the sense of spatial relationship this this um vertiginous sense of 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 looking straight down on her and and you know again the the strokes on the table and the and the the variation in directionality of the mark making in the figure differentiate those planes and define how they are in space Okay, and this is one of the late the late um, Manets. I'm gonna I'm gonna just keep moving because th this painting looks very fresh, but it was painted over and over again, and I know that he he actually would paint it and scrape it out. Now, okay, this is the last masterpiece by by Manet, the Bar at the Folies Bergere. Um, um, he was very sick at this point. He had syphilis and he was dying of it and he knew it at this point. Um, he, I think he knew that this was his last painting, um, at least large scale piece anyway. Um, and in that mirror behind her, kind of where are we? We're looking directly at her, but we're not visible inside the mirror. Um, off to the side, we see this fellow, and he's he's supposedly interacting with her, and that's the back of her in the mirror, if you buy that. Very interesting um, uh, use of distortion. Um, and then, you know, there's what's on sale here. You know, what's going on? What's the interaction between her and that guy? Uh, we don't know. And this place is literally a circus. Um, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a couple of feet. They're on a, a trapeze. So <laughs> there was a lot going on at the Follies Berger. Uh, not even going to try to address the expression on her face. Uh, wait a minute, don't want to skip over those, those, I'm going to go to previous. These beautiful roses were the last works by Manet. Um, they are, you know, really fabulously painted pieces. And uh, I just, you know, can't say enough about these pieces. They're some of my favorites of, of what he did. Um, and these were done on his deathbed, more or less. I mean, basically, he, he, you know, painted them when he had the strength to do it. Oh, okay. Uh, so, uh, Degas lived 30 years longer than, than his friend Manet, and the loss was really felt deeply. Um, Degas went progressively blind in the 20th century by, I believe by 1910, he was having a lot of trouble seeing. And he was actually throughout the time in the, I believe it was the 1880s, he started doing these sculptures and, and, um, 
he would continue to do them, even though he was going blind, he could feel and feel his way around these things. So these gorgeous sculptures, there's tons and tons of them. And the, the Metropolitan has at least 20 of uh, copies of, of, of some of these pieces. Um, and this is one of his last pieces. Manet, this bouquet of peonies, which, you know, is a symbol for passing life. I mean, peonies don't last for very long, so those petals fall. Um, the Little Dancer was, 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 I believe that was in the 1880s when Degas did that, um, but beautiful pieces nonetheless. There's, there's a number of YouTubes on Manet. Um, and uh, this one was a particularly good one. Um, Emily Beanie uh, is one of the curators at uh, Getty out in uh, LA. Um, and she did this talk at, at uh, the Frick. And then I, I found this Hudson Library, which is out in, I don't know where the heck it is. I think it's in Ohio or in Illinois. I can't remember which, but they do some pretty good, you know, all over biographies, but there's a lot of YouTubes on Nene, a lot on Degas. Um, so if you're interested in that, that's available. Um, one thing I'll say is if you can come tomorrow, <clears throat> great, love to see you. If you can't, you can tune in by um, uh, Zoom. So um, that's it. Right. Uh, in, two, in two weeks, we're gonna do um, Nick Cave, who was a really interesting, wild character, um, a lot of fun, interesting guy. Um, he does You're not going suits. to switch it, you don't think? What? It might be a switch you, you thought possibly. It's possible there, there'll be a switch, but we'll see. We'll see, <laughs> okay. All right, so please go to our website and see all the programs that we offer. Our website is chappaqualibrary.org. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Larry, and we'll see okay. you again. Bye-bye.